I think it's important from a context point of view before we get stuck into the results to kind of step back and um, you know, think through the, the context of how we operated in the last six months and what has enabled MTN uh, to be able to be resilient through the challenges, but also to be able to take advantage of the opportunities. I think the first um, thing that I think you'll all agree is that we've been in a macro environment that has been very, very challenging. COVID-19 uh, has had uh, significant impacts on lives and livelihoods across our footprint, and I guess more broadly across the globe. In the developed markets, uh, developing markets that we operate in, uh, the macro challenges have been a lot more significant, and we've seen these uh, challenges come through uh, in currencies under pressure, GDP growth under pressure. And we've been able to navigate uh, these challenges you know, during the period. But it hasn't all been challenges. I think uh, you, know, you would well agree with me that there have been a, a series of opportunities that have come. Uh, and those opportunities uh, you know, really are about the digitalization that is accelerating across our markets. Uh, we don't believe that uh, this is a cyclical trend, but actually something that is actually more structural. And uh, in our results, as we will present, I think you will agree with me at the end that if we are indeed in a structural uh, change in how people are, um, are consuming digital services and using connectivity. So what has enabled MTN uh, to take advantage of the opportunities? And we would argue that there are at least uh, you know, three factors, if not more. The first is that we have sustained investment in our networks and our platforms over a period of time and created an advantage, particularly in our networks, to be able to take advantage of the demand that has surged, uh, particularly over the last 18 months. We have very strong market positions pretty much across all our markets. Uh, we've spoken in the past that um, you know, we have number one and number two positions. And having that scale enables us to have efficiencies where we're able to provide more services, but also deliver quality earnings and returns uh, to our investors and, uh, and broader stakeholders. We're also very focused on capital allocation. Um, the disciplined capital allocation is a feature of this management team. Uh, we're very focused on that, and I think uh, the investors would uh, probably uh, you know, repeat the ladder of priorities of uh, capital priorities, and we've been executing with that capital framework in mind. And very importantly, what you have is a management focused on execution, uh, executing on our strategy, executing on our vision, and this is the underpin of the results that we'll talk about today. The headline earnings, um, adjusted headline earnings per share is a standout number that we would like to point out in terms of our financial results. Um, the adjusted headline earnings looks at the core operational earnings momentum of the business, and that's uh, just shy of 32% up in the period. I think the other call out in the financial highlights that I would pick um, is just the balance sheet. Uh, we've spoken to investors in the past that we, we do want to uh, have a faster deleveraging of the hardcore balance sheet, and we have executed on that in the period. Uh, at the end of December 2020, our hardcore uh, leverage was 2.2 times. We set a target uh, in March uh, of this year that we want to be under one and a half times, and uh, through this period, uh, on the basis of the upstreaming that we've seen in the markets, stronger upstreaming actually in the first half of this year than last year, um, as well as RAND strength, we've been able to see uh, our whole net debt position uh, coming down to 1.4 times. Uh, and, I, and Sulu will, will uh, elaborate in more detail you know, how that debt profile has improved, and we are well on track uh, to, do, to doing what we said we would do, which is to uh, deleverage faster and create greater financial flexibility uh, for the group balance sheet. The other standout item that I would pick on the financial highlights is the operating free cash flow, which is up 51%. Uh, I think you know, at the end of the day, uh, service revenue has to uh, you know, convert to cash flow, and we're seeing a good conversion of that coming through in the period. For me, one of the most impressive um, numbers to point out in the highlights has been the ROE. Many of you will remember in 2018, we spoke about ROE as our new target, because at that time, we were generating returns at equity below the cost of equity. I think what we can say pleasingly is that um, we've seen very good RE um, um, improvement in the business. In 2018, we were 11.5%, and now we're talking about 18.3%, uh, which is 
getting us towards our target of ROEs above 20, creating sufficient headroom between uh, the cost of equity um, or um, you know, the cost of uh, capital for the group. And this is something that we are very focused on as a management team. The other point that I would like to highlight on this slide is really about uh, the dividend and the dividend policy. We just want to reiterate with this interim uh, results presentation that we're maintaining the position that we communicated in March, which is that um, we anticipate that the board will declare a minimum dividend of 260 cents per share uh, in um, March 2022 as a final dividend. So there's no interim dividend right now. And the board will apply its mind um, having reflected on upstreaming, particularly from Nigeria, uh, how the ARP program is progressing, and just more broadly, the COVID-19 impacts across the market. And on the basis of assessing those conditions in March next year, and seeing how we've progressed, particularly uh, with the ARP program, and as I, as I mentioned, Nigeria upstreaming, um, the board remains open uh, for further uh, shareholder distributions at that point in time. We enhanced our medium-term guidance uh, in March this year. Uh, we were more specific on what we saw as service revenue growth at the group level, moving it to low to mid-teens. South Africa, we maintained the mid-single digits. In Nigeria, we spoke about uh, double-digit growth. That's more in line uh, with uh, around um, the mid-teens, given the inflation environment that, that, that's in, in Nigeria. We also updated the guidance uh, with fintech uh, because our belief is that we can accelerate uh, the fintech business uh, towards 20% uh, over the next five years, and we will um, you know, advance with that. So those were the, 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 um, the changes that we made uh, against our medium-term guidance. And I'd make two call-out statements on this chart. The first is South Africa. I think South Africa's performance uh, has been exceptionally strong. Uh, this business is firing on all cylinders and we are ahead of the medium-term uh, guidance of 4 to 6%, having achieved the 9.3. So I think that's one of the standout uh, comments I would make uh, in terms of the medium-term guidance delivery in the half. The other one is the hold core leverage, and as I mentioned, that uh, the hold core leverage um, at the half here is below our, 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 or in our range that we wanted to be in, uh, below one and a half times. And uh, with the additional upstreaming that we received uh, from Nigeria, post the half on the performer basis, that's 1.2 times. And as I mentioned earlier on, we're 2.2 times and uh, we've made material progress. As we look at quarter and quarter performance, uh, we've seen an acceleration pretty much across all measures of commercial momentum. Um, you know, Q2 has been stronger than Q1. Um, and even on the basis, I mean, if we normalize Nigeria, um, where we've had the NIN SIM registration challenges in the beginning of the year, um, you know, we actually added 5.4 million sub subscribers to our base. And within the context of Nigeria, we are seeing an improving trend um, of declining net additions. Um, and to give you a bit of a data point, um, in February, six months ago, we're seeing 1.6 million uh, as declines in our subscriber base. And as the end of July, that number was more like uh, half a million. So the trend is improving, and we believe by the end of this year, we're gonna be well back into growth. On our FinTech side, um, we're seeing acceleration both on the user net ads and also on, on the revenue. I think voices are also an interesting um, uh, uh, trajectory. Um, in many markets, people think uh, voice is dead and not growing or has gone next growth. Across our portfolio, gro voice is still an important bearer and um, you know, just under now, uh, just half of you know, total service revenue, but it is still a material um, you know, part of our revenue mix. But I think the most important uh, point uh, on this chart is really that you know, Q2 momentum you know, has been pretty strong and uh, uh, positive to the results that we have uh, you know, delivered in the half.